The U.S. unemployment rate for May was 13.3%, which is a slight improvement from April, but still significantly higher. A study published last month shows that more than 100,000 small businesses have permanently shut, leaving far fewer jobs to return to after the pandemic. Stunning. Associate Professor of Economics at Bard College, Pavlina Chernova, thinks that the U.S. should adopt a permanent solution for unemployment, a federal jobs guarantee. The case for a job guarantee details her argument for voluntary employment opportunity in public service to anyone who needs it. And Professor Chernova joins us now via Skype. Her book was also just announced this morning as one of the Financial Times best economics books for the summer. Congratulations wow. on that, Professor. Great to have you back. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be back. Absolutely. So why do you think that a federal jobs guarantee is such an important and such a correct direction for the country to go in? Because we really have only two choices. The economy on its own doesn't create enough employment opportunities for all. And when we are in a deep crisis as, the, as this one, firms don't have incentives to create a lot of jobs and enough jobs for everyone. So what we have is two choices, either guaranteed unemployment, which is typically the case, or guaranteed employment. And so the proposal here is straightforward. If somebody is looking for a living wage job, they can just go to the unemployment office and along with all the other assistance that they get, one of the options will be unemployment option. Um, and it will be uh, as proposed in my book in public service because we have neglected so much of the public services over mm -hmm. the years. So, Pavlina, one of the most interesting things, we, we actually have some exclusive polling here. Let's throw it up on the screen from Hill Harris X about support um, in the middle of a pandemic for that. And we actually showed it. So 78% of Americans support having a federal jobs program for the unemployed at this time, Stunning. with only 11 unsure and 11% who oppose. It seems to be widely popular. I guess one of the criticisms of it is about, you know, creating government competition with private markets. What's your response to that? Well, I think that uh, that's a good feature of the firm. I mean, isn't competition what the market economy is supposed to have and thrive on? So um, if the public option provides some competition, especially for the low paying, poverty paying, uh, bad jobs in a sense, I think that that would be an overall improvement. And look, what we know is that we have not secured the bottom, the floor for people. Many are living in poverty, jobs are precarious. We need some sort of structural policy to strengthen labor markets and raise the floor, firm up the floor, provide so-called so the incentives to firms to match those conditions and pay. Yeah, and by the way, we should say that poll is actually from last October. Right. So who knows what the probably numbers are higher. now that we're in the middle of a pandemic. It's probably even higher. Um, Professor, one of the debates that we covered very closely here on this show during the Democratic primary was between Andrew Yang's vision of a universal basic income freedom dividend, as he called it, and Bernie Sanders' vision of a federal jobs guarantee, which is more what you're advocating for here. How do you see those two policies? Do you see it as an either or? Do you see them as in conflict? And why do you prefer a federal jobs guarantee? I prefer the jobs guarantee because the universal basic kingdom has really the right diagnosis of the problems with the labor market, but I see it a little bit as a surrender to those labor market policies. That um, the argument being that you know good jobs, the market doesn't create good jobs, so we should provide income, unconditional income to folks. Where my hope uh, would be that we put in place a structural policy that actually strengthens labor markets and labor conditions. Now, I don't see them exclusively as either or because clearly uh, we're not talking about 100% employment, that everybody should be working and folks who cannot need some uh, assistance and also a decent uh, safety net as well that may not be an employment safety net. So I see them more as working in tandem, uh, but the job guarantee is really the only guarantee that if somebody wants work, they can find it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Professor, one thing I also want to get with there, which is that in the context of this pandemic and all this we have right now, what are the types of things, the services that people could be going into and working for? I know that Mark Cuban, you know, here on this show, he called for a federal jobs program for contact and test tracing. Is that an example of the types of services? What would people be doing um, in a federal jobs program? Yeah, absolutely. Public service. I mean, that is one public service. We know that the public sector is responsible 
not just for unemployment, but the fallout of unemployment, and also for the, all the various other crises that we face. So the COVID crisis um, is one, um, uh, one area that we could have addressed quite quickly had we had a job guarantee in place where people can apply and get employment opportunities in contact tracing and mobilization and providing assistance to hospitals, field hospitals, you name it. But if the infrastructure were there, uh, then we would have been far better prepared to actually put those resources to use. Now, you know, we are faced with uh, millions and millions out of work. And so just contact tracing is not going to do it. And in my book, I make the case that uh, we have long neglected our environmental concerns. We have a looming environmental crisis before us. And th there's a reason why the job guarantee was called perhaps the most crucial piece of that green agenda, because it will address those environmental needs and will also ensure that people who are displaced from their fossil fuel jobs can find meaningful employment in the green economy. Mm -hmm. Professor, let me ask you this. This might be an unanswerable question, but it's something that I've been thinking about. And part of what is so radical about what you're proposing or what you know a sizable UBI is proposing is Right now, a lot of our economy is based around this sort of brutality and coercion. Like you have to work at these, you know, very challenging, low wage jobs that don't provide a lot of satisfaction and barely allow you to keep your life together because you have no other choice. What you're saying and also what UBI advocates are saying to a certain extent is we're going to provide another choice. Right. And partly that is competition. Partly it's also power for a workforce that they don't have to put up with that. They aren't subject to that level of sort of brutality and coercion anymore. How do you think, and this is the unanswerable part potentially, but I bet that you've thought a lot about it. How do you think that that shift would fundamentally change a society? Well, I mean, unemployment structures so much of our economy. How you uh, negotiate with your employer, whether you tolerate harassment, whether you accept poverty pages and brutal working conditions. So the threat of unemployment is really looming over even people's uh, lives. Now, especially those who are most vulnerable and those who work for uh, very low pay. So their power will significantly increase as a consequence of having this choice. And that's exactly what we want. We don't necessarily want uh, this cruel game of musical chairs and this you know, economy that... Um, it, that ensures that people have to, you know, prove themselves worthy to survive, to live. Mm. That is also behind the UBI motivation. I think the difference is that the UBI and the job guarantee allow you to opt out of bad jobs, but only the job guarantee allows you to opt in to a decent paid employment opportunity. Mm. Well, thank you so much for your insight here, Professor. We really appreciate it. Congratulations on the book. Everybody should go pick it up. That's right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Of course. Next on Rising, the New York Times' Maggie Haberman caused Twitter outrage by saying Biden has some flaws. <gasps> Our thoughts on that when Rising continues. <laughs>